Hi, I'm April. I am a singer, songwriter, and music teacher, and I am also a massive fan of Leonard Cohen. So today we are going to be dissecting his most popular, most famous, most ubiquitous song, Hallelujah. Hallelujah is consistently ranked among the most popular cover songs of all time. And for good reason. I think it is poignant, it's beautiful, the melody is so singable that it just really lends itself to artistic interpretations. Plus, Leonard Cohen was never really a singer. He was always just a poet and a musician who happened to sing his own songs. So when you do cover Hallelujah, it's really easy to come up with your own sort of version of it. I was really curious about how you all felt about this song, so I asked in my community tab which version was everyone's favorite. And like I kind of suspected, the majority of people said the Jeff Buckley version was their favorite. So in this video, I'm going to be talking specifically about that Jeff Buckley version because it's the most popular and you all seem to like it the most. So when we take a look at these lyrics, the first thing you're going to notice is that he repeats the word hallelujah a lot. This is because hallelujah follows a verse-refrain structure. There isn't an actual chorus, but we kind of get the idea of a chorus because that one line gets repeated so many times. In this song in particular, it works really nicely because the word hallelujah is often used as that exclamation at the end of a phrase. The other reason that verse-refrain works really well here is because this song is telling a really specific story, and the story is kind of broken up into little vignettes. Each verse is its own tiny little self-contained scene, which means that every section could stand alone on its own, even if it were outside of the song. As a fun piece of trivia, Leonard actually wrote 80 different verses for this song, which is insane. That is a crazy number of verses. But it kind of makes sense because each one of these verses is sort of interchangeable. You don't necessarily need one in order to understand the other, but you do get this buildup of emotion with every verse that you hear. And that's actually another reason why this song is covered so often, because each version could have any number of different verses. Which is why the Leonard version is lyrically different from the Buckley version. He wrote so many different verses that you can kind of pick and choose the ones you like. So different artists tend to put them in various positions in the song. Leonard Cohen was a poet long before he was a songwriter, so these lyrics are very poetic. Obviously there is heavy religious imagery in this song, which actually I think is a little bit misleading, because this song is anything but religious. It is super, super secular. And I think this is why so many people are so offended by the Christmas version of it. Also, Leonard was Jewish. As we get started, the outline is going to look like this. I'm going to give my interpretation of this song, but you can also take each of these verses and just analyze them yourself to figure out what you think everything means. If you disagree with me, that is totally fine. Let me know your interpretation in the comments below. So pretty much every version of Hallelujah starts with this verse. I heard there was a secret chord that David played and it pleased the Lord. The first verse of this song sets up kind of the main struggle or the main idea of the song. The theme that we're going to be coming back to again and again and again throughout this video, which is the theme of religion versus a romantic partner. Essentially, he is worshipping this other character. In this first verse, he does something really awesome and clever, which is that he uses the concept of word painting. So in this section you hear the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall, the major lift, and while he's singing all of these specific things, the chords and melody are actually following everything that he's talking about in the song. When you hear the words, the fourth and the fifth, he's actually playing the fourth and fifth chords in the scale. And then you hear the minor fall, you hear it go to an A minor, and you hear the major lift, where the melody kind of goes up. The way I interpret this is that he is doing exactly the same things that David did to please the Lord. So in doing this, he's kind of setting up this comparison to this other person and actual God. He's saying God was pleased when he heard this specific arrangement of chords, but you are not. So the main idea of this section, as far as I see it, is that you are harder to please than God. Which is a crazy start to a song because it really gets us thinking, 
oh no, what is this main character going to do to try to impress this other person? Whenever we hear this refrain line, hallelujah, it's really being used as a way to kind of accent whatever happened in the verse. This one word alone is going to do so much heavy lifting in this song. When we hear hallelujah at the end of this first verse, the word hallelujah typically means praise God or I worship God, right? So in this case, it's not so much saying I worship God as I worship you, as in the other person in the story. So when you've just heard this whole first verse and you hear that phrase, hallelujah, it sounds like he's trying to tell us, I worship you even though you don't care. Now let's move on to the second verse. Your faith was strong, but you needed proof. You saw her bathing on the roof. The first thing that I notice in the second verse is a lot more religious imagery. Most obviously, the reference to cutting someone's hair is talking about the story of Samson and Delilah, which is the story of Samson being betrayed by Delilah when she cuts his hair, which was the source of all of his power. So this sets up a pretty obvious dynamic between these two characters, that this person he's singing about is alluring and beautiful, and that there was something really special between them. But she's also capable of betrayal and of destroying everything that he holds dear. Not only that, but she's willing to rob him of everything. He ended this verse with the phrase, from your lips she drew the hallelujah. And this description feels really forceful. Like she's doing all of these evil, terrible things because she wants to be worshiped. By the time we hear this next set of hallelujahs, we imagine our protagonist at knife point like bloody and gory and lying on the floor being like, why did you betray me? And this hallelujah comes out of his mouth like a whisper. So when I look at this lyric, the first interpretation that comes to my mind is, I worship you because you've given me no other choice. The third verse goes like this. Baby, I've been here before. I've seen this room and I've walked this floor. The verse before this comes across like a whisper, but this one comes across much bolder. It's intense and it feels very grounded. Suddenly those religious images are just gone. To me, this scene feels like the aftermath of the previous scenes. It illustrates that the entire relationship up to this point has been a war. They've been fighting battle after battle, and now we're left on this empty battlefield. It is so poignant and evocative. It's also worth noticing that this is the first verse where he actually describes their relationship in reality, that they actually lived together, that they were a very serious couple. And you also start to see why they're broken up. She's acting like she's won this war, like she won the relationship and came out of it on top. But he responds to this notion with the idea that a breakup can't just be won or lost. It's just a messed up, broken thing that you kind of have to deal with. At the end of this verse, when we hear hallelujah again, it's cold and broken. It feels empty and hollow, like a prayer to a god that you don't believe in. The fourth verse goes like this. There was a time when you let me know what's really going on. I love this verse because it's starting to take the war imagery and the biblical imagery and bring them together for the first time. That holy dove representing peace in both contexts. This verse is really tender compared to a lot of the others, and it kind of goes back in time to a time when they actually were really happy together. We get a glimpse into what was good about their relationship before everything kind of got tainted. There's this beautiful nostalgia for a time when they communicated and were happy together. And he uses the phrase moved within each other, which I just think is so beautiful. When he ends this verse, he actually uses a phrase that he's used before, which is the idea of drawing breath. Whereas before it was about, you drew the breath from my mouth because you were trying to take it from me. This time they're breathing their love in like oxygen. This hallelujah is about their love. It's thank God we found one another. I love that this verse comes so late in the song because we've already seen what happens to these characters. We know that they wind up hating each other and miserable. But in this one moment, we see what made them so special to begin with. And it makes it all the more heartbreaking that things didn't work out. Notice that the word hallelujah here doesn't just contain that feeling of love, 
it's compounding from each time that we hear it. So this word still means love in this moment, but it also means heartbreak, and it also means anger. So after you hear, every breath we drew was hallelujah, and it's this beautiful balloon-like joy, you feel it deflating with each time he says the word hallelujah here. You kind of follow his journey of loss and cynicism each time you hear this word. It's like, ah, oh, God, we were so naive for having believed in each other. Now, there are a bunch of different versions of the song, and I did say we were going to focus specifically on the Buckley version. So in the Buckley version, this is the last verse, but I am going to go through what the actual last verse is in the Leonard version, because I think it's just a really interesting contrast between the two artists. So the final verse in the Buckley version goes like this. Maybe there is a God above all I've ever learned from love. Right away, we hear again a cold and broken hallelujah. This is a line we've already heard before, so it's familiar. And it's worth mentioning that this repeat happens only after we've had that really positive, beautiful, reminisce verse. This is kind of a cold, hard reminder that pff, we're back down to earth now. We are done reminiscing here, and things are over. The opening line here, that maybe there's a god above, is a really great reminder of this full overarching metaphor, which is that idea of god versus relationship. He's saying that all along, love, and specifically this love, has been his religion. And after everything he's been through, he's not sure that he believes in it anymore. He says that all he's ever learned from love is that you should hurt the other person before they hurt you. That's really cynical and really sad. Love isn't about helping someone or finding enlightenment. It's about trying to fill this empty hole inside of yourself and realizing that it's going to continue to be empty. It's about false promises. He tells us that love just leaves you broken, but still hoping for companionship and answers. So you just endlessly repeat these words, hallelujah, 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 hoping that you'll find something more. So this is where the Jeff Buckley version ends. And it is bleak. <laughs> like, it's really upsetting. And again, this is kind of why the Christmas version is so baffling to me. Or really any version where you'd hear this song in a church or any similar circumstance. It just doesn't make any sense because this song is really, really negative. <laughs> now, all of this makes sense coming from an artist like Jeff Buckley. But what's interesting is that Leonard's version actually ends a little bit differently. He actually added one more verse at the end, which goes like this. I did my best. It wasn't much. I couldn't feel. So I tried to touch. In this verse, he says that he couldn't feel, so he learned to touch. Now, this could mean a bunch of different things. There are tons of interpretations here. You could go really literal, that he couldn't feel love anymore, so he learned to rely on sexuality, for instance. It could also imply that he's giving up on faith, or the things you can't see, and learning to focus on the present, or the things you can see. But after all of that, he gives us what I feel like is the moral of his specific story, which is that he'll still stand there and say hallelujah. So he is still one of those love-struck fools that we talked about in that previous verse. He still believes in love, and he's still waiting for it. So yeah, weirdly, Leonard Cohen's version is a lot more optimistic than, say, Pentatonix's version. Whew. So we got through all of that. Thank you for sticking with me through that entire big long description. Or if you're just joining us and you've skipped over the previous part, welcome back. Now we've reached the moment that we've all been waiting for, which is how to write your own version of Hallelujah. So I'm not sure that it's possible to write a song exactly like Hallelujah without it feeling kind of like a ripoff, but there are lots of things that you can take from Hallelujah that I think we can kind of play with and have a lot of fun with. So the best starting point, I think, is to figure out what word you're going to use in place of hallelujah. The word hallelujah has a lot of really specific connotations. It's a religious word, it's a word that means joyful or happiness or worship. And it's also an exclamation. It's something that you say at the end of a sentence. Interjections show excitement or emotion. The only truly comparable word that comes to my mind is the word amen, which is kind of used in really similar contexts. And I think honestly it would be a really good refrain line, because you'd be able to use it as that interjection 
to kind of add to the end of each phrase. But you could also use a totally different kind of exclamation, like you could use yes, or finally, or please. These are secular words, but I do think that they do a really good job of being molded to whatever it is that you need to say in each verse. If you do want to do something a little more religious, you could also go with a word like God or heaven or something else along those lines. But you might have to just add a couple more words around it, like you are like heaven, for instance, would work really nicely. If you want to go straight up Bill Wirtz with it, you could also just use the word hallelujah and put it in a completely different context, and that'll work too. Just make sure that your song is different enough from the original version that it doesn't feel like you're plagiarizing or ripping it off. So when we boiled Hallelujah down to its main idea, that main idea was, I worship you. There are actually tons of songs that use this specific main idea. For instance, Take Me to Church is a really great example of this. And I actually kind of wonder if that song was using Hallelujah as inspiration because a lot of the imagery kind of feels like it might be. Another example is Madonna's Like a Prayer. Both of these songs use verse-chorus structures, and I think they both do it really well in completely different ways. But go ahead and listen to those songs or read the lyrics, because I think they do a really nice job of comparing those ideas of religion and relationship. The intro and the first couple of lines of each verse follow an alternating pattern between the one chord and the six chord. So in the key of C, that would be a C and an A minor. A minor is the relative minor of C. So to me, this sort of feels like it's juxtaposing these ideas of the good and the bad, or the positive and the negative, of the same concept or of the same idea. So in the case of this song, it'd be the positive and the negative of, let's say, this relationship. But if you don't want to follow me down the rabbit hole of what every single little detail could mean in the greater scheme of things, you could just pay attention to the fact that it's the tonic and the relative minor, and we're just going back and forth between them because it's simple. Because we want that kind of simplicity when we're trying to convey something really complicated in the lyrics. When you're listening to a song for the first time, you can only really pay attention to a couple things at any given time. So Leonard is trying to draw you into the lyrics here instead of getting you bogged down by a bunch of crazy stuff that's going on in the harmony. After we get the C and the A minor alternating for a little bit, we get that word painting that we talked about before. So in this case, we're hearing the fourth, the fifth, a minor chord, and then a major chord in which that melody is going up. After all that word painting, we get something that's really cool, which is that we get a chord that doesn't appear to actually be in the key. That chord is going to be an E7 in the key of C. Now the reason that this chord sounds so good in this context is that it's something called a secondary dominant. The way secondary dominants work is that we'll take the chord that we have to get to, and in order to make it feel more intense or more elevated, we take the fifth of that chord's scale and we put it before the chord. And what this basically does is it sets up our chord as kind of the one chord, but only for a moment so that it gets that feeling of intensity like we're going to the one chord, and then we go from there back into our actual key. Are you trying to eat my plant? So in this case, all we have to do is count up that scale until we get to an E, which is the fifth of that scale. The fifth chord of any scale is called the dominant. So in this case, we're taking that dominant and we're placing it right before our A minor. So we're taking E7 and having it go into an A minor. And the reason that this sounds so good is that we're actually taking A minor and turning it into our one chord for just a moment. Dominant chords are very unstable, which means that they really want to go to the one chord. So when we hear that E7 chord, it's putting us on the edge of our seat, even subconsciously, so that we really want to hear that A minor, exactly in the same way that a G really wants to go to a C. Now, after you've created your amazing secondary dominant, you're gonna wanna figure out where to go for your chorus. So in Leonard's case, he alternates between an A minor and an F. After this, on the very last hallelujah, we get a C going to a G, which is of course the dominant of that C chord, and then we go back to our tonic, or our C chord, which makes us feel nice and beautifully resolved. And that's really the whole thing. This pattern just repeats through the rest of the song. This particular song is very metaphor heavy, so what we're going to do is start by talking about how to create a metaphor. So to me, when I think about a metaphor, I think of comparison between two different things. So because of who I am as a person, we are going to make two separate lists. 
And in each list, we're going to be describing the two things that we're trying to compare. So in this case, love and religion. On the left is my list of things about religion, and on the right is my list of things about love. So on both of these lists, I tried to come up with kind of stories and images and just things we associate with these two different topics. Once you have your two lists of the things that you want to compare, start by thinking about what they have in common. In this song in particular, you get things like, I worship you. But you could also say things like, my original sin was loving you, for instance. Or you could talk about how the day you left was like the flood. Once you've got some imagery to work with, you can start organizing your verses. You can do this in chronological order, you can do it in order of intensity, like start with the least intense story and just build and build until you get to something that's really powerful. Or you can kind of do what Leonard does, which is basically a mix of the two. And I think part of the reason that these sound so good is that he had like 80 different verses to choose from. And they're all self-contained stories. Each one could go in just about any place within the song. So the takeaway here could either be write like 80 different verses and make sure they're all self-contained, or it could just be to make sure that your verses all make sense one after the next and build the intensity as the song goes. The final thing to consider when talking about lyrics and Leonard Cohen's lyrics specifically is that he has this really interesting blend of poetry and colloquialisms. He says things like, I didn't come all this way to fool ya, with the ya instead of you, but immediately follows that lyric with, I stand before the Lord of song with nothing on my tongue but hallelujah. So there's obviously this interesting thing that's happening with the actual language being used. To me personally, this style paints a really interesting picture of this protagonist. He's someone who wants to feel poetic, but also lives in the modern world. And of course, like everything else in this song, the contrast between these two ways of speaking just highlights this main idea even further. The idea of comparing a modern romance to these ancient stories in scripture. The last thing we're going to talk about in this video is melody. And the melody here is actually really simple. And throughout most of the verse, all he's doing is singing one note melodies. We start on that C major chord and he plays a G, which is the fifth of that chord. And as we move to the next chord, that A minor, we move to the one of that chord, which is A. So really it's just two notes, G, A, G, A. And then he finally breaks out of that one note melody pattern by playing an F. Super simple. It's mostly one note melodies because first of all, not much has happened in the story yet. So I think of it kind of like walking. So you're kind of going back and forth and back and forth, one leg to the other. And as I said before, the simplicity is also here so that you pay attention to the words because the words are the most important part, at least during this part of the verses. A complex melody where you're really trying to follow everything around would really just get in the way. The second half of this verse, however, is when it starts getting really interesting. He doesn't necessarily get rid of those one note melodies. He still uses a lot of repeated notes, but what he does do is he just takes us up a major scale all the way up until an E. And at that point he stops and then goes back the other direction. By taking us up this entire scale, it feels like he's taking us on this journey with him. He wants you to feel that elation, that feeling that everything is going right, and then that feeling of disappointment when it doesn't. When we get to the refrain line with all of the hallelujahs, we start to hear just this pull back and forth, and it's just three notes. Da-da-da, 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 da-da-da. And eventually he takes us in this little stepwise pattern back down to the tonic. So we feel resolved, but it also feels like we're grounded when we didn't necessarily want to be grounded in the first place. So the melodic takeaways here as I see them are that if you want someone to feel like they are swelling, go up the scale. And if you want someone to feel like they're crashing, go really suddenly down the scale. But if you want someone to feel like they're more gradually falling or becoming disappointed, Going down the scale more slowly can help you kind of get that effect. In other words, let your melody tell the story. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, be sure to let me know in the comments below, leave a like, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and be sure to ring that little bell to be notified the next time I post. Generally set apart from a sentence by an exclamation point, or by a comma when the feeling's not as strong. Ooh.